Today we'll continue with the flexible binding. This video will continue with the book block fording. The major operations will be rounding and backing and edge trimming. At the end I'll show a bit of the edge colouring and sewing headbands, but this is covered in detail in other videos. Before gluing up the spine of the book, I'll tip on the first and last sections and the end papers. Tipping on or tipping in is to attach with a thin line of adhesive. I'll use a piece of folded paper to mask off approximately 3mm or an eighth of an inch from the spine of the section. I'll use a smaller brush to apply PVA and then bring the section or end paper over onto the adhered area. Because PVA has little slip, I'll need to get the sections aligned first go. The sewing will tend to pull the sections back, so as I pull it over, I'll pull it towards me. With my head over the spine, I'll be able to see if the spine folds are aligned before touchdown. I like to have the outer section and end paper slightly towards the foredge, just a tad. These sections won't move in rounding, and if they are perfectly aligned, even after rounding, the edges of the book will flatten out at the shoulders ever so slightly. This will go away in backing, but can make it difficult to make narrow shoulders. With age, books tend to fail between the end paper and first section, and the first and second sections, and tipping them together forces the book to fail somewhere else later. Also, occasionally the outer sections will shoot forward during rounding, and this tipping on will avoid that too. Next, I'll glue up the spine using PVA. I'll knock the book up to the head and spine and put it in a finishing press between boards. I'll then apply a thin layer of adhesive between the cords. I'll put the tails of the knots in the grooves between the sections. I'll use my fingers to work the adhesive into the spine and remove any excess adhesive at the same time. Too much adhesive will make the spine stiffer than necessary. Once the adhesive on the spine has dried, I'll take the book out of the press and transfer the trim marks to the waste sheets and put a trim mark on the foredge. I'll use a square to transfer the trim marks to the head and tail. Unevenness in the cord thickness can make this a bit difficult. The foredge trim mark is measured from the spine at the head and tail. Once all the trim marks are in place, I'll measure the diagonals to make sure all the trim lines are square. If they're not, I'll use a plastic square, which I can align with the spine under the cords to find out which of the head and tail trim lines are not square and remark them. After this, I'd check the diagonals again. I'll also mark the shoulders by measuring the board thickness from the spine, 3mm in this case. The order of operation I'll use for trimming is the foredge first, then round the book, and then the head and tail. The head and tail are difficult to trim because of the swell. After rounding, the swell is mostly distributed, allowing the head and tail to be trimmed. Because this is a fairly small book, and the cheeks of my lying press are fairly wide, the spine swell will get in the way of putting the book in the press. I'll use some thick boards, not as wide as the book, to pack out at the foredge to remove this problem. Actually, because the rear board sits higher than the edge of the book, this board is a bit wider. I'll trim the edge using the plough in the usual manner. 
The foredge is usually faster to trim because you can advance the blade when moving the plough in both directions. Before starting this work, I make sure I have a good hour when I won't be disrupted. Rounding is easier if the spine adhesive hasn't completely cured. The PVA I use, which is actually an EVA, is set enough after about 10 minutes. It's no longer tacky, but still soft. I'll round the book in the usual way by putting my thumb into the foredge and drawing the outside of the book away from the spine while gently tapping the upper part of the spine with glancing blows. Moistening your fingers will help grip the outside of the book. If you do get interrupted while doing this work and the spine adhesive does set up, it can be softened again with a bit of heat from a hairdryer. I'm going to round this book to about one-fifth of a circle, which is a gentle round. Some of the books say to round to a third of a circle, which I generally think is too much. I'll explore this more in a video on rounding and backing. Since this book is gently rounded, I haven't completely distributed the swell. If I put it into the press without any compensation, the book will try and round itself further, but make a bit of a mess of it. So I'll add boards to the front and back that have been beveled and I'll put the beveled edge into the shoulders. The minor complication with this is that the spine of the book is not as compressed as the rest of the book block. If the spine of the book is facing me, when the plough is travelling towards me, the spine fold area is not supported with paper behind it and is likely to tear out. To avoid this, I only advance the plough blade before pushing away from me. The stand the press sits on is called a tub. It catches all the scrap paper. The tub's legs are raked in one direction, so it is stronger to work from one end than the other. When I do the other end of the book, I should put the spine away from me or transfer the trim mark to the other side of the book. With the spine away from me, I need to advance the blade on the opposite stroke but my brain struggles with this, so I just plough from the wrong end of the tub. Traditionally, this style of book would have been trimmed very differently. It would have been done in boards. After the boards are laced on, the boards can still move up and down. For the head and tail, the book would have been put in the press with the boards drawn down, the width of the square, and then the edge is trimmed. Trimming the foredge is even more convoluted and used things called trindles, which were inserted around the cords with the boards folded back. As the boards are fully opened up, the trindles force the spine back to flat. The foredge is then trimmed and the trindles are removed, allowing the spine to go back to its rounded shape, which then results in a rounded foredge. I believe Arthur Green is writing a chapter for the next edition of Suave Mechanicals about this subject, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about this process. I've tried it a few times and it was a complete failure. Once the book is trimmed, it's time for backing. Backing is putting shoulders on the book. Backing a flexibly sewn book has the added complication of the raised cords being in the way. I'll flip the press over to get the plough guides out of the way and put the book between wedged shaped backing boards and into the press. Getting the book into the press with the boards level with the shoulder lines and the book in its nice, symmetric, rounded shape can be a bit like herding cats. But with patience and by going slow and edging towards the goal, it can be accomplished. Try and get the book and the boards into the press close to where you want to end up. A bit of spit on the boards will help them stay in place while everything is put into the press. The residual swell from the gentle backing and the wedge-shaped backing boards means the book will start to back itself as the press is done up. Once the press is done up tight, I can use my thumbs to back the book even more. If I was only trying to get 45 degree shoulders, I could probably do that just using my thumbs and maybe a bit of help with a bone folder. But to go beyond that, I'll need to use the hammer. 
but the head start will make it much easier. As mentioned, backing a flexibly sewn book has the complication of having the cords in the way. It is easier if you have a small faced hammer that fits between the cords. My usual Barnsley number two is too large. Traditionally, a square faced hammer is used for flexibly sewing books. I bought a used one years ago, but it's very large. I suspect this is why it was being sold as I've never used it. But I do have a Barnsley number one, which does fit between the cords. If you don't have one of these hammers, don't wait until you do, just use a small, smooth faced claw hammer. Other than this, I back in the same way I usually do. I start away from the ends. The ends don't have sewing threads inside the sections, which makes it the hardest part of the book to back, the part that shows of course. Using glancing blows, I aim a few sections away from the centre of the spine, working back and forth along the length of the book starting gently until you think the sections have started to bend to your will. Then do the same on the other side of the book. Once the sections are moving as you want them, move out to the ends of the book. Then repeat while moving away from the middle line of the book. One of the problems with fast fording is that it makes it look like I'm hammering straight into the spine of the book. Like I'm hammering in a nail. I'm not. I'm always trying to strike the spine of the book in a glancing blow, drawing the sections away from the centre line of the spine. I've left a few bits at normal speed, which I hope makes it clear what I mean by the glancing blows, at the very edge of the book, at the shoulders, to get it close to the nice 90 degree shoulder, the blows may be a bit more direct and less glancing, but close to the centre of the spine, a direct blow will just crush the back of the sections. I've spent way too much time thinking about how to line the spine of this book. Because this book's structure was used for such a long period of time, there is a lot of variation in spine lining techniques. I also couldn't find any broad surveys that would guide me. It's also complicated by the fact that I'm using modern adhesives. At about this point, as described by Matthews, a common step would be cleaning off. Paste would be applied to the spine, which would reactivate the hide glue, and the glue would be forced between the sections in their new positions, and the excess removed. This would set the spine in the new shape. PVA generally doesn't reactivate. My modern compromise is to line the spine with PVA and a thin cotton between the cords. I believe this does the job of holding the book in its new shape. I just cut the pieces of thin cotton to fit between the cords and then apply PVA over the entire spine, including the cords, and apply the cotton. After I sew the end bands, I'll do a final lining of watercolour paper, which will reduce any lumps and bumps and hopefully hide the tie downs from the end bands. That will be in the next video. From the few books of this structure from the 17th and 18th century, I've got to examine where I could tell many books had no lining at all and the leather was glued directly to the back of the sections. To finish this video, I'll quickly colour all the edges and tie the end bands. I saw a book on the internet in this style that had uniformly coloured edges with matching single colour end bands. I was quite taken with it at the time and decided that was what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, my good impressions of this have not lasted, or maybe it was my execution. But you may like to do something less monochrome. I have detailed videos on edge colouring and end band sewing. I used this book block in the single colour bead on spine video. In a fit of whimsy I did a single colour bead at the front on the other end. 
I also recommend you don't do this. In the next video, I'll do the final spine lining, fray out the cords, my least favourite job, cut the boards and lace them on, and hopefully get the leather cut to size. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. As always, I really appreciate you hitting the big thumbs up button. If you're able and want to, you can support the making of more videos like this through Patreon or with a one-off contribution, and the details are in the description below. If you want to be notified of my future videos, please hit the subscribe button and select the notification bell. Until next time, cheerio!